So uh, the talk tonight, what I'm going to do is spend about half time talking about the book and then talk about some extensions that we're exploring at present. And so when you talk about social mobility, there's a very simple measure of that, which is just what is the intergenerational correlation of any measure of status? If the correlation is zero, then social outcomes are completely unpredictable from parents. If it's one, things are completely predictable. And it has this nice property that beta squared here is the share of outcome variance that is explained by the parents. And what is the received wisdom on this? Well, at least amongst economists, uh, there's a very simple picture that uh, tells us a lot about measures of social mobility. And here we have the inequality of income displayed on the uh, horizontal axis. And then here we have the intergenerational correlation of income on the vertical axis. And what you see in this picture is the following. There's a lot of variation across societies in how closely income is inherited. But secondly, in the Nordic countries, for example, the correlations are actually very low. And the implication is that something like only 4% of income variation in any generation in Sweden is actually explained by inheritance. And surprisingly, this picture suggests a world of very high rates of social mobility. But the other thing that we see is that since this rate varies across societies, it has this implication that it must be cultural and social and institutional factors that are the crucial determinants of inheritance uh, rates and, and social mobility rates. And also that some societies must see a systematic misallocation of people of potential talents to tasks or status in society. Uh, and that there really is a kind of significant uh, social mobility uh, problem. So that's the contemporary picture. Um, what can we do with surnames that might give us some different insight into this process? So it turns out that surnames in many societies are formed with different initial social status. Uh, in England, surnames are mostly formed by the late Middle Ages. And at that time, surnames that indicated a place are of much higher status than surnames that are just patronyms. And so if your name is Rochester or Berkeley, you're typically a much higher status person than if your name is Johnson. Uh, and then, again, Sweden, there's very distinctive types of surnames. And so there's a whole class of aristocrats that have legally protected surnames now, uh, but aristocrats who were created in the 18th century and often were foreigners, and so they have very distinctive names. And then people who went to college would take Latinized surnames like Linnaeus. And so the intellectual elite in Sweden, the descendants of the, those intellectual elite of the 18th century is still quite distinctive in surname terms. And then somewhere like India, you have very distinctive Brahmin surnames. You know all of those Indians. Uh, they are the ones that heavily populate the universities of the United States. Um, and so we get this difference in surname status. And also in a society like England, where there's enormous variety of surnames, random shocks will just cause perfectly ordinary surnames to acquire relatively high status or relatively low status in any given generation. And then we can just think about, well, what happens to surname status over time? And so what is going to happen here is that with high rates of social mobility, all common surnames in any society will very quickly become average in their status. And surnames that deviate will very quickly return to the average. And so the surnames the, the movement of status among surnames is showing the rate of social entropy within societies. And we can actually use that. And, and the big convenience is that we'll see that in somewhere like England, we can measure social mobility rates back to the Middle Ages because it's economical and information. You don't need to know the specific connection between parents and children in order to extract the information about social mobility rates from surnames. And as we can do this in somewhere like England, and that's what I'm going to illustrate by just looking at various different surnames. And in England, we can link some people back to their ancestors of 1066. So there's a class of surnames in England, about 0.8% of all surnames, that descend from the Norman conquerors. Uh, and we can actually then say what happened over time to the descendants of the Norman conquerors. And one interesting factor is that 
in armies of the 15th and 16th century, these names are still disproportionately represented. Uh, and in fact, even at Sandhurst in the 19th century, there still is a surprising persistence of the names of the Norman conquerors uh, still amongst the military class in England. Um, now, the only issue with surname measures is that they're going to measure social status along the patriline, and they ignore all the other lines of descent. And that is only going to be a problem, though, if the patriline is somehow distinctive from, for example, the matriline. And so one of the things that wasn't included very much in the book that we've done some work on since is to look at what is mating for men versus women? And is mating more highly assortative for men than it is for women? And the nice thing you find in England is that it's precisely symmetrical. That women marry men who are very like their brothers in terms of their characteristics, even when they have no formal status in 19th century England, and that there's actually very high degree of assortativeness in mating, and that actually the patriline is going to actually tell us what the general lines of descent actually look like. And then just to illustrate how powerful these name connections can be, there's a famous English family, the Peeps, which de descended from one obscure founder in the 15th century somewhere in Eastern England. There are only 12 people who now hold this surname. But as far as we know, they descended completely, that they are the descendants of that original Peeps in the 15th century. And we can actually trace the fortunes of the Peeps family just by following what has happened to that surname over time. But the interesting thing is that those current Peeps have very little of the genetic material of the original Peeps. It's the marriages that were made by the Peeps men through the course of these generations that have resulted in those 12 people now actually still having very high social status. Four of them are doctors in England. Uh, and, but it's actually, it's the, it's the marriages here that are actually the crucial element that's going to be allowing the status to actually m maintain itself or move very slowly. And so what's the advantage of these surname methods? It turns out that you just need to know two facts about any society. The first is, what's the surname distribution in general in each generation? And the second is, what's the surname distribution among some elite share of the population? And if we know that for each generation in a society, we can estimate the implied rate of social mobility within the society. And so what I'm going to do is show you an example of this in England. And so as I say, what we need is just some cutoff that indicates an elite. And then we're going to assume that for any measure of status, you can normalize in such a way that there'll be a normal distribution of status and that some fraction of the population here, 2.5%, will fall above this cutoff. And then what we're going to observe is some elite surnames, which will have a larger fraction falling across this cutoff. And then as we go from generation one to generation two, what we'll actually see is that overrepresentation fall. That'll imply how much the mean of the distribution has moved. And that movement of the mean will reveal the underlying intergenerational correlation of status for that measure of status. And so as I say, what's nice about this is it can actually be done on a simple Excel sheet. It's informationally uh, very, very simple, right? As long as you can define some elite, and that cutoff can keep changing, know what the general name distribution is, and know what the surname distribution is for your elite, then you can easily estimate these underlying rates of social mobility. And so what are the elites that we can observe in England? We know the students who went to Oxford and Cambridge from 1170 till the present time. And so that's one very distinctive educational elite. Up until the 1830s, there are no other universities in England. And so you can observe the, the educated elite. We can observe who's probated at death. You're only probated if you have property. Those records go back to 1400. And so again, we can observe the wealth elite in Britain. We know the members of parliament, so we can observe the political elite from 1270 onwards. And we have other measures like army officers, attorneys, members of the Church of England. There's lots of different candidate elites in somewhere like England. 
And then the other thing in England is from 1538 onwards, we know the distribution of births, deaths, and marriages by surname. And so we have all of these different ways of actually estimating what the surname distribution is. And so England actually turns out to be a very nice society in which to do these estimates of social status. And if you want a kind of summary of how we can do this with Oxbridge, we actually have an article published in Human Nature uh, recently in 2014 uh, that actually summarizes this. And this is what the data looks like. So this is starting, this is a table that goes all the way back to 1170, but we just divide up by generations, how many Oxford students are observed, what's the total stock of Oxford students, what share of them come from England, what's the population they're drawn from, and that tells us then how elite is Oxford and Cambridge. And that's there, and it varies over time, and it's typically about 1% of the population. And so that's the upper tail of the educational distribution. And then, how do we find elite and non-elite surnames in 1800 to 29? We just go and take rare surnames. If there's someone with a rare surname who's at the university, a surname held by less than 500 people, that implies that it's relatively elite, on average. Right? We don't have to, some of these are not going to be elite, but they just on average have to be elite. Here's what these surnames look like. And then in, you can contrast those with rare surnames where no one showed up at the university. And you can see that these surnames don't look particularly distinctive. And so the nice thing is going to be here is that the surname itself is not going to do any work. It's just a marker. It's like a sequence on, on, in DNA, a neutral sequence that's just indicating who belongs to this lineage, who doesn't belong to this lineage, okay? And so then we can just take these surnames, and what we can do is say, well, what share of people at Oxford or Cambridge had this distinctive group of surnames going on later in time? And so the next generation, about 12% of people had these surnames, even though they were only 1% of the population. And that's how we know that this, is, uh, this group is 10 times overrepresented at the university, and then that overrepresentation is falling steadily. And then from that decline in overrepresentation, we can calculate mean status, and then we can calculate for every generation what the implied rate of regression to the mean is of educational status within this group. And whoops, so that's, we're just implementing this scheme here. And here's what the picture looks like. This is in log terms. This is standard deviation units from the mean in educational status. And this is this group that we found over time. And the amazing thing here is that typically when we do this, we'll find that one line can pretty much fit the data. That is, that most of the time, you have an impression of very constant rate of regression to the mean. And then the other stunning thing is that the implied intergenerational correlation of educational status with the surnames is typically between 0.7 and 0.8. And if we take the surnames, we can instead go and look at relative probate frequencies for these same names. The data we have here only runs up till 1966. But what you find again is one line relatively well fits the data. <laughs> and the implied intergenerational correlation of wealth here is very similar. It's very high. It's 0.81. And so the surnames then are presenting this kind of fascinating feature that the intergenerational correlation of status revealed by surnames is always much higher <laughs> than that revealed by individual studies of inheritance of status. Something different is happening here with the surnames. It's typically in the range 0.7 to 0.8, and it doesn't seem to vary much across time, place, or type of status measured. And so if you go back here to the Cambridge data, this rate of intergenerational mobility has not changed much, even though in the 19th century, Cambridge was largely a gentleman's club, where entry required knowledge of Latin, and where specialized public schools like Eton and Rugby prepared most of the entrance. As we move along in time, only in the 1870s in Britain did you have universal public education. Later, you had public support of people going to Oxford and Cambridge. Before that, you had to finance yourself privately or with a scholarship. But still, I went to Cambridge in 1975 from Scotland, and so I was the first person from my school to ever go there. I sat the exam in mathematics to get in, 
it was so specialized that you could get the exam questions, the previous exam questions, but not the answers. And so, and as I say, it was such a specialized exam that there's nowhere available <laughs> any set of materials that would reveal what is it that they're looking for here. I mean, what is the, the nature of the thing here? So it was still quite specialized even in the 70s, but now what's happening is that they use exams that are administered in every high school in the United Kingdom. And they use the results in those exams. And so what's happened is that we should expect a much more democratic university system, much less social rigidity. The amazing thing is there's absolutely no sign in this data <laughs> of any greater rate of social mobility following on all of those changes. And you can go and look at the records of parliament in Britain in this period. You can find the rise of the Labour Party, the rise of a new politics. But what you find is that the names of the leaders of the Labour Party <laughs> are as closely related to elite names in the previous generation as it is if you look at something like the Conservative Party. And so what's actually happening is that somehow you can have vast social changes here, but very little change in this underlying rate of social mobility. And if we look across countries, here is Sweden, which on conventional measures shows up as having very high rates of social mobility. Here is the implied intergenerational correlation of status measured by features such as university attendance, uh, medical doctors, attorneys. Uh, it's just as high as in Britain. And in fact, it's just as high as in medieval England or pre-industrial Sweden. Uh, and similarly, Japan, South Korea, England, USA, Chile. The only country that shows up as being somewhat distinctive is India. And it shows up because it has even lower rates of social mobility than these other places. And so it's in the region of 0.9 in somewhere like, and this is the data for West Bengal, okay? And so what you've got here then is it's an extraordinary persistence of status. And once you actually see this phenomena and go back and look at the data, it's not at all surprising. And so it turns out there's a nice website which is devoted to the genealogy of the English intellectual classes. I think it's hosted by Stanford University, where people have figured out all of the interconnections between the English intellectual elite. And so one of the things that does is it tells you who are Darwin's great-great-grandchildren. And so he had 10 children, but only 27 great-great-grandchildren. And it turns out that 11 of them, even though most of them, half of them at least don't have the name Darwin, the surname, 11 are notable enough to have Wikipedia pages or Times obits if they already died. And they do everything. They're university professors, authors, conservationists, film director. So I'm, go to the, I, I'm a member of the, probably the 30th best economics department in the United States. Darwin's great-great-grandchildren are more distinguished on average than my colleagues and myself, right? And as I say, this kind of persistence once you actually could see it in the data, the surnames are revealing something that's actually true about the society at the individual level, right? It's not that there's something odd about the surnames. What they're actually doing is making very clear that the ordinary measures of social mobility somehow are failing to capture a very great deal of persistence that's occurring in all of these societies. Now, the very simple hypothesis of the book, and it's just a hypothesis because it's extrapolating beyond anything we can prove, is that the reason this happens is because social mobility is actually encapsulated by two very simple equations. At any time, people have status phenotypes. Their observed status on education, income, wealth, longevity, health, height, but those phenotypes derive from some single underlying status genotype. And then what is happening is that status genotype measured as deviations from the mean is actually evolving very slowly with an intergenerational correlation of around about 0.75. But when we observe, so what's actually happening is that people have some latent underlying social status that they themselves are not even aware of particularly and that this is what generates the various manifestations of status that are observed. And that what is happening here is that there's this very strong correlation in this underlying status, but that when we look at the surface manifestations of status, we'll see a much more attenuated correlation. And that attenuation 
depends on how big this error term is translating the underlying status into the phenotype. And so what will happen then is that in societies where income, for example, is a very good indicator of underlying status, it'll appear that those are more immobile societies. In Sweden, income mobility is very high because income is very compressed, and there's relatively little difference between bus drivers and architects in earnings. And so you're not learning much about the movement of underlying social status from something like income. But it turns out that when you start grouping people by surnames, these errors become unimportant. You see the averages then that are actually linked to the underlying genotype, that, as a social genotype as it's called here. And that's why the surnames are actually revealing something different about status movement. They're revealing what's actually happening to this underlying latent uh, variable. Uh, and then uh, this shows up again, for example, in that longevity is very much associated with social class. But at the individual level in England over the last 150 years, the intergenerational correlation between the average of your parents' longevity and your longevity is only something like 0.2. And the reason for that low correlation is that there's just huge randomness in longevity. And so there's this enormous error term at the level of any particular person. <laughs> and so it seems like there's very little information, but if now instead you group people by social class and look at the persistence of longevity over generations, the intergenerational correlation is closer to 0.8. <laughs> and so what's actually happening is that the underlying status that's generating that longevity is changing very slowly, but individual things like longevity are actually bouncing around. Okay? And so that's the, the model of the book. And as I say, the implication is, another, so what, what we can then say, well, what are the implications? So where's Richard McElwraith? Yes, he's here. So a very conscious about uh, what is, how good is our evidence here, right? Because this is an explanation that's been produced in response to observing the phenomena. When, we got, when I got into this, I just wanted to measure social mobility across pre-industrial world. It was a stunning surprise to find that these numbers were very different. And so then we had to think about well, what could encompass this? What could explain this? But one of the things is that this very simple model actually has some interesting implications that we can then take back to the data. And they're surprising and unexpected implications and ones that you won't expect if I now point this out. So what this says is that if we take group averages, we'll move back to the mean with this intergenerational correlation of B. But it also implies, what about if we moved back in time? What about if we took an elite in 1800 and instead of going forward, said, where did that elite come from? And it turns out a consequence of this simple structure is that time will be symmetrical backwards and forwards. That a group will go back to the mean at rate B and it will deviate from the mean at the rate B to become the elite at this time, <laughs> right? And it's just a very simple implication of this structure, but a non-obvious one. <laughs> and one that we can actually take to the data. And what does this look like in the case of these people at Cambridge? What you actually find is if we take this elite from around about 1800, and these are two different elites. This group here is defined by being at the university at this period, surnames. This other group was just defined by having wealthy surnames. What we see is that both groups move back slowly towards the mean, and they move back at a relatively constant rate, though it's not identical between those two groups. So that's a deviation from the model. But then we can look at what, where did these groups come from? And what you find is that in both cases, it is essentially symmetrical. That the elites of 1800 were already above average hundreds of years earlier and actually marched upwards on average to the position they attained at this point. And there's no mechanism here. It's just a statistical process whereby the elite at any time tends to be drawn from a candidate elite, which is just below them. And most people are actually moving back to the mean. But the average path to get to eliteness is that you don't make a jump from the average all the way to the eliteness. The most common path is going to be having good luck over many, many generations. And so just statistically, 
This will be the path that's implied by the model. And as I say, you can actually see it very nicely in the data here. I mean, there really does seem to be a very simple underlying social physics. Um, what's another implication? Controlling for parents, grandparent characteristics will predict child outcomes if this model is correct and we look at any particular characteristic. Controlling for grandparents and parents, great-grandparents characteristics will again predict child outcomes. And so what it says is that if I want to predict a child's outcomes, I will always have a better prediction every relative that I then include in the estimation. And the entire lineage is predictive of the outcomes for any particular individual. And it's just, again, a function of the structure of the model. And what it's going to look like then is that it, it looks like when we get children that somehow grandparents seem like they have an independent influence on the outcome for the child. If I have a child who has a rich parent but a poor grandparent, I'll predict a lower outcome in terms of wealth than if I have a child who has a rich parent and also a very rich grandparent. And so, and again, this is true, and we can actually check this. We have data in England now where we can check this across five generations, and it absolutely works. That it's always the case that the collateral relatives are actually predicting this. But what's interesting is, in this model, it all flows through the parent. The grandparent has absolutely no independent influence. <laughs> And that's actually interesting because I know there are a lot of parents, uh, papers now in anthropology that are concerned with well, what is the nurturing and other roles of collateral relatives. But the interesting thing in this model is it will predict the same kind of empirical patterns, but in this case, grandparents pr purely provide information about what the true underlying status of the parent was and consequently what the predicted outcome for the child will be. Okay. So that's something else we can check. And so this brings me then to what is the, the huge question here, uh, and the most interesting one is, if we do observe this slow, constant, underlying rate of social mobility, what's driving this? And why is it relatively impervious to quite dramatic changes in institutional structure? Why did medieval England have similar social mobility rates to modern social democratic England? And why is Sweden have the same slow underlying social mobility rates as uh, Chile, uh, even though on conventional measures they're supposed to be very different? And so the question is, is our resources important, are social networks important, or is actually genetics that is the main carrier of social status? And the book has a second hypothesis, which is, that the great majority of all of this transmission is actually flowing through genetics. And that this really is a genetic process and that that's why it's so impervious to social interventions because as long as mating is highly assortative in most societies, you're going to observe very similar patterns in terms of the ge genetic transmission of uh, uh, the determinants of status. But it turns out that this has a lot of implications. And if you're interested, I'd say, have a look at the book where we actually try and go through and think about these. What would cause a rejection of this would be if the process is not first order Markov. So at this group level, if it's going to be the result of these additive genetic factors, then what has to happen is that correctly measured, the previous generation has all the information about the next generation and the process has to have that character. And so we can check, is that the case? If it differs across status rankings, that is, if the process is different at the bottom of the distribution than at the top, it would actually rule out a kind of genetic explanation because this will be the product of many, many, many different genes, each with a very small influence. And so it's going to be just like height inheritance. And what we know about that is that it's symmetrical across the, the distribution the, the, rate of the rate of regression to the mean is constant across the distribution. Uh, relatives other than parents should not matter to outcomes if we can correctly measure the status of parents. Relatives other than parents only provide information about the true underlying status of the parents. Maritally endogamous groups should not regress to the mean. And so what will happen is within that group, there will be regression to the mean but to a different mean than for the society as a whole. 
And so an interesting test of this would be that if we observe marital endogamous groups in any society, their status should continue to deviate by the same amount over time. And it turns out that we can observe these patterns. So if you look, for example, at the Copts in Egypt, uh, since uh, the early conversions to Islam uh, in the, what was it, the uh, 7th and 8th centuries, um, the Copts have remained largely distinct and endogamous. And what's interesting is that they have remained an elite in Egypt in, with a slower rate of regression to the mean than you observe in any of these other societies. Uh, and they've remained in that way even though they have no political power within Egypt. And so that's actually a kind of interesting, and we can find other potential cases which would test this idea. Uh, I mean, this doesn't say that it is biological inheritance, but these are things that would rule out biological inheritance if groups like that actually did regress to the mean. If mating is not highly assortative, then this process couldn't possibly work because it has to be that the characteristics of spouses are very, very similar to the characteristics of the, the other partner to get this kind of correlation. If there's just random matching, you couldn't get this kind of correlation across uh, uh, generations. And again, elites and underclasses are not going to be distinguished by particular beliefs and cultures. The way they will get their status is by being selected from a larger population and selected by some process that generates them as an upper class or a lower class. And so we see, uh, and, that, and then again, whole populations as opposed to subgroups won't be able to change social status. And so we can look at things like Jewish history, and what you find is there's very strong evidence that the modern Jewish population is a very small subgroup of an original Jewish population, and that the conversion process to Christianity was strongly drawing on the bottom end of the status distribution in that population. And so it's quite consistent with this idea that it's actually just that the, the way elites are formed is by some process that selects from a wider distribution. What's actually happening now is the United States is engaged in a large-scale experiment because of its immigration policy, where the new elites of the United States, for example, the most prominent new elite will be Hindus or people of Hindu origin. Uh, and the interesting thing will be to see what is the rate of social mobility for that group as a whole. But that's actually just been created by a selection from the elites in India operating through US immigration policy. And there are other groups now, Copts are some of the most elite Amer people in America. Uh, black Africans are again an elite now within the United States uh, because of this immigration policy. Uh, and so we get all kinds of, uh, uh, also Indian Christians are a super elite within the United States. And so you actually see a whole variety of world cultures now represented as elites within the US. And the idea here would be that it's not the particular beliefs or cultures, it's the selection processes that are operating through international migration. Uh, and then again, adopted children's outcomes are gonna have to be mainly explained by their biological parents' characteristics and not by their adoptive parents' characteristics. And it turns out that there's good evidence that that's true. And so it turns out in terms of things like income or educational attainment, at least three quarters of the variance is actually explained by the biological parents' characteristics and not by the adoptive parents' characteristics. Though there is some influence of adoptive parents, but the question is how much does that persist all through the life course? Or is it the case that the adoptive parents can influence the children early in their life, but if we were to look at them later or look at their children, would you actually see rapid re regression to the mean? And then the thing I wanted to talk about just briefly today is family size should not be a significant predictor of outcomes. Uh, because even though family size has a significant influence on the resources that are available for children, if this really is largely a genetic process, then family size should actually not make a difference. And so that's what I want to talk about. And so since the, the, the book came out, uh, we've actually launched on a project to collect a, a huge amount of data on about currently 60,000 people born in England between 1750 and now who all have rare surnames and were selected to either start off as very elite or very underclass well, what we want to do is actually construct all of the individual links across these people. 
and then use this database to test various of the ideas here about what is the mechanism that's actually driving the connection between the generations. And so one of the things we can do then is look at the effect of family size in this population. And so if Q is child quality and N is the number, sorry, that should be the number of children, then there'll be some connection between numbers and Q, but there's also always going to be this unobserved error term in terms of uh, the quality of uh, children. And the uh, problem is going to be here that the, uh, if there's covariance between the numbers of children and that error term, it's going to bias any ordinary least squares estimation of this. And so what we find is that parent quality is going to be positively associated with child quality. But in the modern world, parent quality is often negatively associated with the number of children. And so that it's very hard to actually figure out what's the effect of parent quality on child quality because of that other association and because we can't observe in any way perfectly what parent quality is. And so the numbers of children may just be a signal about what the underlying parent quality truly is and that consequently we're not picking up the effects of the number of children and child quality. It's just giving information about the true status of the family. And so what will happen then is the effects of child the numbers of children and child quality, there's going to be some true relationship and potentially some much steeper observed negative relationship with modern uh, families. But for England, 1790 to 1880, we have this interesting phenomena that before 1790, there's a positive correlation between completed family size, that's children who reach age 21, and social economic status. After 1880, the correlation is negative, but there is this nice period from 1790 to 1880, families, marriages from 1790 to 1880, where there's no association, where family size seems to be essentially a random shock, and where there's also nicely great variance in family size, completed family size, this is. And so as I say, using this rare surname sample, we can get information on wealth at death, age at death, education, occupation, marriage, fertility, children's first names, we can get all kinds of information on these families and on various aspects of status. And as I say, what we're trying to do is complete these individual linkages where we can get raw data on births, deaths, and marriages. And then we have to somehow link people together. And so we do machine linkage to get candidate links. And then the problem is that you actually, because of the vagaries of English spelling and of the, the recording of names, you have to do hand linkage. But it also turns out, interestingly, that there's a tremendous amount of individual information that people have put up on Ancestry about their own family histories. And so you can find for all of these families whole sets of data where a lot of this data is also even sourced, and which is actually revealing all of the links that people believe exist within their own families. And so we're also exploring about whether or sometimes we can crowdsource a lot of this and somehow use the collective wisdom <laughs> of people's individual genealogical explorations. And so far, as I say, we're only part of the way through this process, we're able to generate for these people uh, a huge amount of data then on births in this period where families seem to be largely of random size. And then you can see the collapse in fertility here with the demographic transition with this population. And then this is reflecting partly just population growth in England, the large population growth in the Industrial Revolution period. And so what we have in the database so far is, and one of the reasons I wanted to mention this before this particular uh, audience is that I think there may be lots of other interesting things that once this is completed, you could do with this data. <laughs> And so I just wanted to, to make clear that what we're building, and then people may have ideas about interesting things that you could actually uh, exploit this for. Because as I say, we have now 21, nearly 22,000 fathers and children linked, but also nearly 2,000 fathers and great, great, great grandchildren linked. And so we're actually building up this web of relationships, husbands and wives. We have collected a lot of data on sons-in-law as well. We have fathers and daughters laws. We have data on sibling pairs. And so the ambition, as I say, is to build up this entire web of genealogical links <clears throat> and to get information on 
all kinds of aspects, uh, including things like location, which would indicate status, wealth at death, occupation, for all of the people involved here. And one of the things you find for this data, for example, is you see here that for the richer or poorer lineages, that fertility is not systematically different for marriages formed before 1880. After 1880, you see this significant difference where poorer people have significantly greater fertility measured even here by just numbers of children surviving to age 21. And the other thing that's actually nice in this data is that if you take the cohort size of the original rich versus the poor, you can see that it's stable uh, by definition here about one in the 1840s. And then you can see the collapse of the upper classes in England in demographic terms. Uh, and that uh, there has actually been this very significant replacement of upper class families within Britain, mostly occurring around about the time that Galton <laughs> is very concerned about this, and then stabilizing later. But you actually do see these significant shifts within the population as represented by these families. And as I say, the nice thing is that in the period where large, family size is large and seemingly random, the errors in estimating what the connection is between children's numbers and children quality, there's not going to be much covariance between N and unobserved aspects of family quality. And the other thing is that the variance here of n is going to be very large. And so the bias will correspondingly, if it exists, also be minimized. And here's the distribution of family size measured in terms of by family. And that's actually truncated. It goes up to 18 in terms of children who reached age 21. And so you get this enormous variation in completed family sizes. And just measured by the share of children in each family size package, as I say, you see this enormous range. And the random elements in net fertility can be illustrated by William IV. He initially had a mistress with which he produced 10 children, eight of whom were alive by 1837. Um, he then took his responsibilities seriously, got married, married a relatively young wife, had a happy union, and managed to produce no heir, and is succeeded by his niece. And so what you're seeing here is that men could have multiple wives with one wife, large numbers of children, with another wife, uh, uh, no children. And it just seems to be, as I say, elements of, of randomness about people's physiology. Um, what's evidence that this fertility variation it really is largely random? Less than 7% of the variation across families can be observed, explained by observed characteristics. The intergenerational correlation of fertility in marriages in this period is 0 0.03 and is not significantly different from zero. And so again, there's a sign that, you know, and then that intergenerational correlation becomes positive once we move towards the modern era, though it's still relatively very low, okay? So it seems that fertility is random. What's the consequence of this? If we take richer families, we're going to Oxford or Cambridge as a big measure of educational success for sons. What you actually see is that family size has no effect on the probability that the sons will attend Oxford or Cambridge. Longevity is another indicator of success. Sons who go to Oxford tend to live five years longer than sons who don't go to Oxford. Um, again, there's no effect on longevity of these enormous variations in family sizes. If you take wealth, there is, and take the log of wealth here of the father, uh, what you do find is that the numbers of children that the father has significantly influence the wealth of the children, right? But the interesting thing you can do is then take, because of the structure of the data, take grandfathers, look at their wealth, and then look at the number of children they had, and then what should happen is the next generation, as I say, there's no inheritance of fertility here. So basically, this is a random shock that occurred one generation earlier in terms of how the wealth got divided up. And what you find is by the time of the next generation, there's no longer any significant negative effect here, right? I mean, the standard error is uncomfortably large here, but what you can definitely say is that that effect has become significantly smaller over time and may well actually be zero. And so shocks to wealth do show up very clearly in the data, but the interesting thing is that they seem to be disappearing, right? And with this data, we can actually then go to the third generation and the fourth generation and actually say, does it make any difference in people's lives? And another thing we can do is just look at the probate rates for grandchildren. That's another very strong indicator of wealth. If we take 
the grandchildren of the richer lineages, they have still very high probates later. Poorer lineages, much lower probate rates. But if you look at the grandfather's family size, it has no effect in either case on the probate rates once we get to the level of the grandchildren. And so the interesting thing in this data is that it really is actually consistent <laughs> with genetics really being the main carrier of status in this case. Uh, what are other tests we could do? Does it matter to grandparent effects if the grandparents are alive or dead? Again, with this data, we can easily check this. Does birth order matter? Does the age of the parents at death? Does the age of the parents at conception matter? Do more extended family networks also matter? There's lots of kind of interesting things I think you can do in the data here to explore uh, what is the influence of uh, uh, social networks, uh, communities, connections, as opposed to just the pure genetics uh, that's being passed from one generation to the next. Thank you.